Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, I know we're really behind schedule. and I'm pretty hungry. So I'll try to not take your time for too long. Uh, so I was asked to talk about bigger data sets imaging at scale. But really what I'm going to talk about is uh, taking that and can we really build a foundation model for MRI? Uh, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, we put all of our code on GitHub. And so these are some of the repositories that can reproduce the results of this work. And I encourage you to check it out. And anytime I talk about software, I also want to give a plug for BART. It's our reconstruction toolbox led by Martin Luther that lets you use uh, high dimensional data processing for MRI in a clinical environment too. Okay, so what are foundation models? Uh, this is in the context of machine learning. Uh, usually you might say that the first answer is chat GPT, right? That's a foundation model that everyone's familiar with, but there's many other types of foundation models. There's Dolly 2 and stable diffusion for image generation. There's Clip, Whisper, we saw a segment and anything model, Dino V2. Some of these are generative, some of them are classifiers. It's not necessarily that they all have to have the same type of architecture, but one of the big features is that they're trained at billion scale data sets as opposed to tens of thousands of millions. That's really where you start to see the benefit of these models on multiple tasks. Uh, unfortunately, most foundation models are closed and this is a key problem for kind of a competitive AI ecosystem and a reproducible. Okay, so what would a foundation model for MRI have? Uh, these are just kind of my own recipe of what I would like. Uh, that it should be modular, flexible, task agnostic, meaning it's not just designed for one particular task. Uh, it should be robust to different clinical environments, meaning different anatomy, contrast, protocols, MRI vendors, and ideally it should be open as well. So how do we go from millions to billions? That will be one question that I'm not particularly gonna answer, but hopefully as a community, we can figure out. And I'm gonna take a step back now and talk about the use of foundation models in the context of MRI reconstruction. So we've already seen this uh, in this workshop, which has been really great seeing uh, image reconstruction for different types of modalities. In the case of MRI, we can think of this inverse problem where we have an image that goes through our MRI, our MRI machine, gives us case-based measurements, we want to design a reconstruction algorithm to go back to the image. And uh, compressed sensing in particular has been really uh, popular and really successful and has been implemented across the vendors, especially from pioneering work at NYU here, uh, that is now available as products. But I'm not going to talk about compressed sensing. Right now we're really using deep learning as an inversion tool for this MRI forward model. And there's kind of two flavors of using deep learning. One would be the sort of end-to-end -end model, whether it's supervised or not, and another would be generative model. So I'll just quickly talk a little bit about end-to-end -end supervised training and why I think it's not the way to go for a foundation model for MRI. It's really powerful because it learns to invert the forward model with deep networks, but the key feature, which also could be a bug, is that it's trained for a specific task. So if you're going to use end-to-end -end supervised training, it's state-of-the-art for that specific task. In NYU and Meta, a few years back teamed up to do this uh, fast MRI challenge. And if we scroll through the public leaderboard, all of the top models were end-to-end -end supervised networks trained on a data set uh, to give really high performance. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom, we'll get to the classical baseline compressed sensing, which was powered by BART. So all the way at the bottom, you get compressed sensing. It doesn't really work well, but something strange does happen. If you scroll up a little bit, you'll actually see that there's a lot of models that do nothing, they just return the zero filled image and they actually perform better than the compressed sensing model. So what's going on there? Well, it's important to also understand this is for a specific task. So what is what are you calling your ground truth, right? If you have a particular ground truth, then you might be able to match it really well. And in particular, uh, and I saw also a really exciting poster um, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, it really depends what you're calling your ground truth. In some cases, we might use multi-coil data to create a root sum of squares image, and in others, we'll create a minimum variance unbiased estimate, which is coil combined with sensitivity maps. And of course, these are not the same. There's a bias coming from the magnitude uh, reconstruction of the RSS. And if you apply this and look at a reconstruction that uses, for example, a zero-filled root sum of squares compared to a compressed sensing or even an end-to-end -end deep learning method, applied to the task of reconstructing MBUE, then the zero filled reconstruction actually gets the best score, even though qualitatively it's the worst. So that's just to say that you have to be very careful when you're designing a task specific network, what is the actual task that you're comparing to? Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the drawbacks of end-to-end -end supervised training 
and why we are looking for a different way of creating a foundation model for MRI. Uh, one issue is that the deep network is coupled to the measurement process, right? This is actually an advantage if we know what the measurement process is going to be. And so this is some work um, out of uh, Iowa that trained an MODL end-to-end -end network on a particular sampling pattern. But if the sampling pattern changes at test time, then of course the network result will degrade. And that's because it hasn't seen this kind of distribution shift at training time. Uh, we also were interested in using deep networks for motion correction. And if we train a network to go from motion corrupt images to clean images, it works pretty well, but it's hard to predict what the motion pattern will be. And it of course depends on the acquisition trajectory as well. And so if those things change, in other words, a train test mismatch, then the quality will be great again. Okay, well, maybe we can take these networks and then just improve them with some data. Uh, the issue though, is that these networks are very big. They're tuned to a particular anatomy, contrast, sequence, et cetera. And so for example, if I train on me and test on me, I get a certain performance. But if I train on brain and test on me, then there's sort of a drop in performance. I'd really like to be on this Y equals X line. And this is true for any reconstruction method I use, but it's particularly challenging when we have so many parameters in the network to adapt it to a new task. And finally, another drawback is that estimating uncertainty is challenging. I'm actually quite surprised that we haven't heard a lot about that, about uncertainty uh, this uh, workshop so far, because when we're applying these types of models, we really wanna know that what we're getting is reliable. So we would really like to have some measure of, of uncertainty in our results, right? And end-to-end uh, -end supervised training is not really, you can sort of retrofit uncertainty estimation into it, but it's not really by design. So the approach that we take instead is uh, distribution learning or generative modeling. We wanna use the power of deep learning to learn something important about the, uh, the image data that we have while still obeying the physical laws. And so what we do is we use deep networks to learn the prior distribution. For example, these are samples from some probability distribution of T2 weighted brain images coming from vast MRI. And what we'll do is we'll decouple the statistical image prior from the measurement model. And then we can use Bayesian principles for reconstruction, for example, finding the posterior distribution, the most likely image X given the measurements. Uh, we've seen in, uh, in a lot of the news lately that generative models are really powerful image generators. So these are some of the uh, no longer state of the art, but recently state of the art generative models that can generate images from a particular training set of distributions. Right. Uh, you can also go to this website, this cat does not exist.com. Every time you hit refresh, you'll get a new cat. Okay, but we're not reconstructing cats, we're reconstructing brains. So we can also train a generative model on uh, MR data and, uh, and then effectively learn this type of prior distribution. And so I argue that for MRI, this is a really attractive approach for foundation models. And so we've developed a diffusion or score-based foundation model for MRI, and here diffusion doesn't re, uh, refer to the contrast, it refers to the type of sampling process that goes from uh, an arbitrary noise-like image to a prior sample from our distribution. And using this concept, we can develop principled modular reconstruction methods that are robust to changes in the measurement models and the distribution by design, but that also could have theoretical performance guarantees, much like what we would see in the theory of conventional optimization. Okay, uh, all right. So just back to the basics, what's the statistical interpretation of what we're doing? Really our goal is to estimate the image X from some noisy measurements Y. Uh, the likelihood function describes the imaging physics, right? It doesn't matter what we put in the MRI scanner, whether it's a low field scanner or a really highly performant one, we have some uh, likelihood function P of Y given X that explains how the image turns into data given our noise model. We have some prior knowledge of what we're imaging. This would be the probability distribution of the space of images. And in conventional optimization, when we think of something like compressed sensing, we might maximize this posterior distribution, which is finding the most likely image X given the measurements Y from a distributional point of view. But if we have access to the full posterior, we could do other things like sample one image from the posterior distribution. And we could also sample many images from the posterior distribution 
and create a conditional expectation, this would be the minimum mean square error estimate under our prior model. And so it has a lot of uh, attractive properties for why we might want to reconstruct this particular point estimate. Now, what does it look, what does it mean to have a prior distribution over MR images? Well, we can think of this very high dimensional space of uh, images, right? This one, uh, an image represented as a vector and maybe an all zeros image or an all noise image would be a very low probability MR image. Maybe an alias image would be slightly higher probability, but still low probability. And then we have different regions of local maxima of high probability images, say T2 weighted over here, and maybe flare images over here. So if we can create this probability distribution P of X, where X is an MR image, then we can use it for reconstruction. So how would we do it? Well, the key idea is that we don't actually need to know what P of X is because we're probably gonna do some kind of gradient based optimization. In other words, we'll take the gradient of this objective function, which is, uh, represents the math estimate. And what we see is that we have our usual gradient from the likelihood, as well as the gradient of the log of the probability of X. And what's really nice is we can give this thing a name. This object is called the score function, and we can potentially learn the score function using deep networks. So we're not necessarily learning the probability distribution, but we're learning the gradient of the log of the probability. So what does that mean? If we give it, if we give this gradient log probability function, it takes in an image as an input, what it spits out is the direction to move, to change the pixels jointly to get a higher likely image. So we can think of it like there's a low density region of low likely images. And if we pass it through this object, we'll go to a higher density region. And if we can learn a neural network to be a surrogate for this function, then we could query the neural network to move in the direction of higher likely images. Okay, so one question is how do we actually estimate the score function, right? I'm given a training set and I wanna do something with it. Uh, well, a simple answer would be called score matching, which is if I can actually create the gradient of the log of P of X, I can just do mean square error training over a training set and map the parameters of this neural network S theta to uh, the score function. If I don't actually have the score function. If I did, I would just use it directly. And what's really remarkable, uh, some uh, work in the last couple decades is that you don't need the score function itself. You can do this in an unsupervised way using denoising score matching. Uh, and it only requires reference samples. In other words, give me the training set and I can create the score function for you. And that's what our code will do. Uh, if you uh, play with the code, you can give it any training set of whatever type of data you have and then learn the score function. Uh, what's really nice about this is it's independent of the forward operator A. So I'm not injecting the physics of the system into learning the score function. I'm explicitly decoupling. Okay, so what can we do with our MRI foundation model once it's trained? Well, the simplest thing we can do is pass it through the score function and get random samples from the probability distribution. And this would be using an algorithm called annealed longitudinal dynamics. So I start with a random noise vector, a random noise image, and I iteratively pass it through the score function. And at the end of this convergence of this operation, I'll get a random brain MRI image because it was trained on T2 weighted brains, right? So these are all random samples from the score function. But that's not particularly useful for reconstruction, but I can use the same process. And instead of sampling from P of X, I can sample from P of X given Y, right? You give me the measurements in the measurement model, and I'll run a new longitudinal dynamics to sample from the posterior. And so this will be a reconstruction given the measurements Y, which are potentially incomplete. I can also run it multiple times and I'll get multiple samples from the posterior. Every time I run the algorithm with a different initialization, I'll get a different point from this posterior. And what's nice is that uh, although our new longitudinal dynamics algorithm is only approximating posterior sampling, uh, we can say that posterior sampling actually has theoretical guarantees for why it's a good thing to do in terms of reconstruction. Okay, well, now I have multiple reconstructions representing the same data. So I can also use that for uncertainty estimation, right? If I draw multiple independent samples from the posterior, I can create the mean reconstruction, the conditional expectation. This is just another nice example from the fast MRI data set 
which I think has really pushed the field forward, thanks to you, uh, thanks NYU and Meta, right? What we really care about is this really dull uh, region here, and it would be really nice if we could assign some sort of uncertainty to it. On the left is the ground truth minimum variance and biased estimate. Okay, well, I can do as a really first order approximation of uncertainty, just look at the standard deviation of all these images. But of course, this is just scratching the surface. There's probably going to be many different ways of looking at uncertainty from this posterior distribution now that we've actually captured it. But just to say that even standard deviation on its own kind of tracks the actual error that we see between the mean reconstruction and, and the so-called ground truth. Okay, so summarizing this idea with diffusion foundation models, we can sample from the posterior, we can create the conditional expectation, we can look at the variance of the, of the reconstruction and we can start looking at uncertainty. But of course, using this in a clinical setting means that we do wanna be robust to these different types of clinical um, deployment issues that we'll see. For example, different imaging protocols, different patient populations, potentially motion during the scan, and even the training data itself might be corrupt because it's coming from a physical sensor. Uh, as we know with deep learning methods, eventually if we use things out of distribution, they will fail. And this is also true in the case of uh, this foundation model. And so if this data were trained on brain images and then used on knee images, our posterior sampling algorithm does show some artifacts. It looks really nice on the projector. Uh, but what we've observed is that we don't actually need to retrain the distribution, and we have some theory that backs this claim. What we can do instead is use a small amount of training data to just tune the hyperparameters of the network, uh, of the reconstruction. And you can think of this like changing the lambda parameter of compressed sensing. It's one scalar, and so you don't need too much training data to figure out the best scalar for this new protocol. And so we applied this at our, uh, at our hospital on volunteers, so remember the foundation model was trained on fast MRI data and we applied it at our hospital under a different protocol with different slice thicknesses, with different scan times, with different sampling acquisitions, with a different vendor. And we were able to just tune the hyperparameters of the algorithm to get a really good quality. And this is at 4X prospectively accelerated scan. And so uh, in this sense, it's uh, really attractive as a means of deploying these types of models to the hospital. Uh, we're also really interested in using this for uh, the case where there's motion during the scan. And again, an attractive feature of our approach with this foundation model is that we're decoupling the measurement model from the image, right? A clean motion-free image will have the same prior distribution uh, whether or not the subject is moving. We just need to account for the fact, in this case, we're dealing with 2D rigid motion, that uh, there's some unknown in the forward model itself. But since the image prior is decoupled, we don't need to retrain for this particular task. We'll use the same foundation model for this. And we can use similar approaches for other corruptions. For instance, let's say field and homogeneity or uh, potentially something else with the system. And what we'll do is we'll use the same algorithm, but now we'll sample from the joint posterior of the image and the motion parameters given the measurements that we've observed. And so what this looks like is doing posterior sampling through a Neil-Langevin dynamics, starting with our randomized image and the traces of the motion. This, um, this green is the error in the motion. This is sim simulated data, so we're sim synthetically creating motion. And as the algorithm runs, we converge to an image and to motion parameters that match the ground truth synthetic motion that we created, uh, subject to some uh, absolute rotation and translation. Okay, simulation's all good. How does it work in practice? Well, we went back to our scanner. We scanned a volunteer prospectively at 3x acceleration while the subject was moving. And a linear reconstruction of the motion corrupt scan shows these motion artifacts. If we apply posterior sampling without accounting for motion, we're not able to recover the, the motion uh, artifacts. But if we do our joint posterior sampling, we can reconstruct a clean image and the traces of the motion for each phase encode during the scan. And we didn't need to retrain the foundation model. We just used it out of the box, but accounted for the fact that we also have unknown motion to estimate at the same time. Okay, uh, we also wanna use um, this type of model when we're doing multiple scans because every clinical protocol includes multiple image contrasts. 
Again, uh, apologies if it's confusing. This refers to the diffusion model, not diffusion MRI contrast. Um, and what we can do is we can model these types of protocols as really some intrinsic information that is measured multiple times. Think of this like the tissue parameter maps that generate the different image contrasts that are then created, sampled with a particular sampling acquisition. And so this is nothing other than joint posterior sampling again. We've seen this in the MRI community many times, but now we wanna use our posterior sampling algorithm with a foundation model that was trained at multiple contrasts. So what do we do? We train a multi-contrast foundation model. We feed it images from multiple different contrasts. And now we have a single model that we could use for marginal, conditional, or joint reconstruction. It doesn't matter which image is undersampled and at what acceleration factor. Um, no retraining is necessary. It's again, just joint posterior sampling over the two image contrasts in this example, given measurements from both. So we call this reconstruction with side information. For example, if we trained a multi-contrast model on knee imaging, uh, here we have an example of a fully sampled fat suppressed knee. And suppose that we did a, a fully sampled scan of a non-fat suppressed knee as our side information. Well, if we neglect the side information, then we do marginal posterior sampling. This is the image we get with the error map underneath. If we use the um, side information of a 6x accelerated scan, then we can do a little bit better. And if the, if the side information is fully sampled, we can do even better. And, if, and we also compare to an end-to-end -end baseline that was trained on multi-contrast. So this would be something like a joint varnet, uh, but we use an MODL-like uh, architecture. One interesting thing that we noticed is if we look at reconstructing uh, the proton density non-fat suppressed images, so this is uh, what we're given, then we don't actually see a big benefit of going, so the blue curve is the marginal diffusion model, not using side information, and the green is conditioning on it. And essentially, there's no real benefit of using the side information. But if we are trying to reconstruct the PDFS scan, then there's a lot of benefit of conditioning on the side info given by the non-fat suppressed image. And that's because it has a, lot, a high SNR, so it provides some extra information for the reconstruction. Okay, so I promised I wouldn't go over, and I'm already starting to get there. I'll just say as the last thing, Remember that our measurements themselves have sensor noise. And so we need to also account for that. We're not just taking images of cats from the internet and training a generative model. And so what we do uh, in a method that we call sure score is we include the fact that the data are noisy, but we don't know what the true ground truth is. All we have is multi-coil noisy images. Uh, but what we can do is we can combine denoising score matching with something called Stein's unbiased risk estimate or sure to account for the fact that the data are noisy. So we take the fast MRI data, we pre-whiten it, and then we apply this type of objective to learn a new foundation model that accounted for the fact that the data are noisy. And we can do a little bit better by using it for reconstruction as opposed to the naive prior that was trained as if there was no noise in the data, but there is noise in the data. And you can see this nicely when we increase the, uh, when we uh, change the window level that uh, in fact we are reducing the noise in the reconstruction, and that also accounts for lower air. Okay, so what about a true foundation model for MRI? I would argue that what I've shown is not quite there. We're still in the really low data regime, and we need to go from millions to billions. We might even ask the question if we need to tra train a foundation model from scratch, can we take advantage of all the advancements in uh, conventional computer vision uh, to actually use it in the MRI world? And so I'll just briefly mention that one part particular or possible ways to use federated learning. Uh, we could try to uh, take data from different sites and combine it uh, in order to train a foundation model in a distributed way. Um, and then a new site that is never used, uh, contributed might be able to participate, but we do need to personalize their model for their data. And so we've done some of these experiments in the context of end-to-end -end networks, where if we train a federated model over many different types of contrasts and anatomies, and then personalize it at the particular site, then we can get pretty good performance as if we had all the data in the first place. So this might be one direction to go when we try to train a true foundation model. And you can check out our website, fedmri.org, which right now just links to my website, but maybe in the future, it'll be a platform for, um, for actually doing this. So just to conclude, I think robustness to test time distributions is the next major hurdle to using deep learning based methods in scientific applications, like in, the, in clinical and scientific applications and building a foundation model for MRI might be one way to do it. 
Posterior sampling is an attractive reconstruction method and accounting for the measurement process is, is critical. Uh, so that I'd like to thank you for your attention and like to thank the members of my group at the CSI lab and our funding sponsors and maybe you in the future. Thanks very much, Sean. Some uh, very cool approaches there I haven't seen before. There's a lot going on in that, in that space. It's pretty, pretty impressive. We have time for one question? Good question. Please, go. Cool. Hey, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I have a kind of uh, wider question about the use of generative models uh, in MRI. I was wondering if you have any thoughts for people who uh, are maybe a bit worried about uh, kind of behavior like this brain does not exist. Um, when using generative models with MRI, and maybe how that relates to um, versus end-to-end -end models or versus just classical CSMRI. Yeah, if I understand the question, it's essentially about uh, hallucinations and how do we know if we're hallucinating. Uh, I think regardless of the model you use, we need to understand what happens if there's uncertainty, which we will always have because we're not measuring all of case space. Um, and that applies to end-to-end -end models as well. In the context of generative models, I think that there are tools that we can use to actually map uncertainty and then potentially give the clinician another dimension to look at as a way of ascertaining whether or not what they're seeing is hallucinating. So it's not going to be something that, in my opinion, is, is, is in a void without the expert. They'll still be using it, but there will be an additional tool that lets them explore the space. Thanks. Thanks again, John, and uh, let's thank all our speakers. Uh...